Good morning. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to worship. If you're with us online, it's an honor to host you as we continue in the Philippians message series. We have some things to just get us started as we come into worship. First, we'd like to welcome Mark Goodson, who's uh, our accompanist today. A warm welcome from San Pedro would be appreciated. Thank you. You see the celebration pictures from last week's uh, celebration and sending party for Kat and Sean. We also not only want to affirm them, but the fellowship team who put all these great events together. Can we just take a moment to thank the fellowship team and Rose Solis as the deacon over that? A lot of work. It's a lot of work. And you saw, hopefully, before you came in scrolling, some of the pictures we're celebrating. Uh, just a few years of marriage. I think it's five or ten of Betty and Jim Hayes today. So the flowers are in their honor. 63 years, 63 years. So, Betty, I don't know how you did it. That's all I can say. <laughs> Welcome to worship. We continue with the Philippians series. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to our opening prelude. Let us continue in worship by standing and singing the intro together. Worship 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Together, we are confident that the one who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. service, let us go before God together, confessing our sins, first silently and then in unison. Let us pray. in our prayer, we confess. You have given us what we need to serve you in faithfulness, and yet we do not always serve you in joy and love. We forget the sacrificial example set for us in Christ. Forgive us and help us with our unbelief. Amen.
conference hear and accept the assurance of God's faithfulness. God is faithful, God is merciful, and God gives us the strength we need to glorify Jesus every day. Therefore, let us not focus too long on our sin, but instead turn our hearts to the assurance we have in Christ. We are forgiven. Our sins are remembered no more. Thanks be to God. respond to God's goodness and grace by saying together as God's people what we believe using the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
came in. At this time, we're going to take the opportunity to greet one another and allow our children to go to their learning time, Children's Church, as we greet one another and pass the peace. So would the kids have the opportunity to go? Let's greet one another and make somebody feel welcome today. Friends, let us now hear God's word to us today. Our first reading comes from the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel, beginning with verse 3. Hear now the word of God. And those who have insight will shine like the glow of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Our second reading comes to us from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who, has a, who is at work at you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining or arguments so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding firmly the word of life, so that on the day of Christ I could take pride, because I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We're moving into our new house, and we're striving for organization. When you Today's message is things to strive for, looking at Paul's letter. We're, we're striving for organization. And I'm going to be honest, I think this is the best shot we've ever had. This is a dream home. It's laid out the way I would design it. Just, I'm grateful. It's got enough room in the garage. My tools are lined up. I'm a collector of tools. I like to tinker. I like to do a little woodworking, work on the cars. I can find everything. We needed something. I went out. I knew right where it was. Organization of the closets. We're getting it right. But we're still playing this game that I like to call, and I bet you play it too, where are my keys? <laughs> it, it goes like this. Can't find my keys. So invariably, Carrie or myself will use the natural intercom of our house. Carrie? <laughs> Carrie? <laughs> Carrie? Where are my keys? Or Carrie will yell the same, Brian, where are my keys? Or my phone. And you, you play the game where you look in the couch, and then you go around, and then you think, I'm going to look in the couch again. And then you make that triple return, and you realize, okay, I'm losing my mind. I've got nowhere else to look. We're striving for organization. Paul is giving us what to strive for in his letter to the, to, to the Philippians that's much bigger. Today's main idea is about being faithful, being faithful. Can you say those two things with me? Being faithful. Last week we looked at Philippians chapter 1. This week we're looking at Philippians chapter 2. And we are focusing on last week something, you know, to be good at and finding the good in all things, a way to be, finding the good in all things. This week we're talking about being faithful, what to strive for, a way to be, something to strive for. And we've used this memory verse challenge, which I've never used before. And I'm asking you just week after week to just think of these simple scripture references from Paul. These, this one sentence, would you read it with me? For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21, we're going to repeat it every week, and I've been focusing more on the to live is Christ than to die is gain. I did a little video devotional this week and sent it out on the daily devotional. You're always welcome to sign up for that if you don't have it now. And I emphasize, to me in the past, every time I've heard this, it's been about the death part. 
But when you really think about it, when you pass away, it's easy to say things like, oh, when I'm gone, don't mourn for me, or when I'm gone, you know, focus on the good. But the people that are here have to live that. And Paul is living in prison. He's having to live as Christ, which is challenging. He's telling us through his early words of wisdom, no matter the circumstances, find the good in all things. And no matter the circumstances, being faithful is what we are striving for, being faithful. And we're going to look at this today with a standard, and we're going to look at Three specific things as we go through the passage again with a different version of the text than what we read today. We're going to look at Paul's uh, interpretation of God's work, then Paul's encouragement, and then Paul's proclamation. And we're going to have a little response after each one of those things. We're going to look at God's work and our response. Paul's encouragement, our response. Paul's declaration, this is what he knows to be true, having gone through this journey up to this point in his life our response. And then we're going to look at one of my favorite theologians' declaration, and then mine. And I'm going to ask you to come up with your own. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Mm, Not too enthusiastic. Well, let's pray. (laughs) Let's pray and see if we get there. Holy Spirit, come and illuminate the text for us that it would be real, that it would be something that not just we comprehend, but that we strive for, this notion of being faithful that through all the things of life that we strive for, whether it's success or economic security or love in our family or health and wellness, whatever we're striving for, may we see the pinnacle of what Paul is challenging us with, to be faithful in all circumstances. We trust, Holy Spirit, that the Word would come alive for us through your doing something supernatural in us, opening our minds and our hearts to the truth. We depend on you, Holy Spirit, for understanding. Illuminate the text for us today. In Jesus' name, in dependence upon you, Holy Spirit, amen. Remember that Paul's writing his letter with two mindsets. He's confident and he's committed. He is confident the gospel will take root. It will spread when it is preached. It's just a matter of time. And remember, by some estimates, Paul didn't see any results for seven years. So Paul is confident, no matter what's happening in his life, no matter what's happening in the lives of those he is teaching in the early church, the gospel will spread when it is preached. And he is committed to preaching the gospel, no matter what. He's not writing about his own circumstances. He mentions, we read last week, you know what's happening to me, I'm in prison, it's not fair. But he was confident that God would use those circumstances for his glory to spread the gospel where it was preached, and so he's committed to keep on preaching. Now today, for a complimentary text, we have this reference from Daniel, and it's Daniel 12, 3, and it's one of my life verses, and the reason I chose it candidly when I was a teenager is because I could remember Daniel 1, 2, 3. Daniel 12, 3, and here's what it is. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky. I love the imagery. I just love the imagery. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who point many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And you can see my little notes that are in my prayer journal that I've sort of interpreted what those things might be. But it's a beautiful image. Those who point others, those who are wise, will shine like the stars forever, and those who point others to righteousness, a right relationship with God. We're going to have a different way of being. And I love this because Paul references some of the same imagery in Philippians. So we look at the text, and we go back through it, a different version of the same thing you just heard read today for our main text. And again, we're going through Philippians for a few weeks. Read a chapter a week. It's very easy if you weren't here last week. It's one chapter. Read two this week. It's less than 10 minutes. This letter is poignant, and it's challenging. Paul is writing from prison, and it's considered his most joyful letter. Here is Paul's understanding of God's work, what God is doing. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because God is at work in you, enabling you to both will and to work for his good pleasure. This is what God is doing in us. God is working through you and me, so we've got to work out our salvation based on what God is doing. For those of you who think that the journey of faith is about going and finding yourself or discovering some great thing, striving for wisdom on high like in a mountaintop, that is not what Paul is teaching. 
God works first. Before time began, God was at work for his good purposes to work out things through you and through me. So let's take a moment, take a breath, and have our response be a prayer, because we can't do this. If God's the one who's doing the work, I've got to respond by struggling through what I believe to be true, and the easiest way for me to do that is to surrender through prayer. So take a minute and look at this prayer and consider how you would do it in your own life, but I'm emphasizing God's faithfulness, not mine, because I know where my faithfulness is. It's good on some days, not so much on others. Something frightens me, I'm not sure that I'm faithful. So would you pray this with me, and we'll take a moment to just pause and let this sink in. Would you pray it with me? Help me believe in your faithfulness. Lord, help me believe in your faithfulness. Where I fall short and respond to life's challenges with anger or malice or fear or paralysis. Help me learn what it means to respond in faithfulness. To find joy where there is, where there is sadness. To project love where there is hatred. Help me believe in your faithfulness that leads me to a better life, one that glorifies you. Amen. Now, Paul goes on to write with his own sort of understanding and an encouragement of how we're supposed to be, this what to strive for being faithful. He encourages you and me today. He was encouraging the early church, but we use this for today's language. Be children of God who shine like stars in the world. There's that reference that I love. It parallels Daniel. Remember, it is by your holding fast to the gospel message that whenever I, Paul, meet Christ again, you'll prove my service is not in vain. He's challenging us and encouraging us, reminding us that the fruits of his labor are not what he achieves, but how we, as the church, live. And he's giving us the standard by which faithfulness is measured. It's Christ himself. The gospel is, of course, Jesus-centered. We know the good news message is about Jesus, but the standard for faithfulness is Jesus. Imagine what would happen if you really did this, which happens to me often. There is a bounty of examples of failures in my own life, but invariably, when I am aware of it and can think about it, is when someone says, and it works every time, whether it's done with the wrong motives or the right motives, it always works. Is this how Christ would want you to respond? <laughs> no. <laughs> My children catch me in the car. I do not have a temper. It's kind of a, a lot of people think that I would because I'm kind of a high-running energy person, but I grew up with no temperament, and the, there was never, my father never raised his voice or got angry. Um, it was very calm. I'm very grateful for the parenting that I had, and I kind of operate the same way, except when I'm in the car. And you know, San Antonio tests me to the limit. <laughs> and, and Thomas will sometimes say, hey, Dad, you know they can't hear you, right? <laughs> what, what, who are they? Do you have a blinker? You know, these things that I just blurt out on a deeper level, not just irritations with daily life. The standard is Christ. And prayer is the way we pause and reflect and look back at the day before and the things that have challenged us spiritually where perhaps we have not risen to the standard set forth in Christ. This is why we have a time of confession in worship every week. It's not popular anymore for seeker-sensitive churches to have a time of confession, and I've always held on to it, no matter what style of worship I've been a part of, to say, this is who we are. It's okay if it's uncomfortable. We're not telling everybody, you're okay. We're telling everybody, Christ is the standard. We fall short. It's true. It's never been different in the teachings of the early church to now. 
So we confess our sins and we reflect on the standard of Christ. Would you pray this with me? It's on the screen. That we would find ways to hold Christ as the standard in ways that are effective. Would you pray it with me? Bless me with an encouraging heart. Help me believe in your faithfulness, Lord. Your faithfulness, not mine. The faithfulness of your Son that is revealed to us. But Lord, bless me with an encouraging heart that I can find ways to hold the standard of Christ up without coming across as a person who is anything other than a person who also falls short of the standard in Christ. Being faithful, Lord. Help us strive for that. Paul then comes back with his own proclamation, and I think it's beautiful. It's one of my favorite pieces of Scripture in all of Paul's letters because, I, again, I love the imagery. Even if, Paul, even if I, Paul, am being poured out as a libation, this is, again, different than the version you read today. This is the NIV. Pouring it out like a sacrifice I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. And then he says, and in the same way, if he is poured out and sacrificed, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. Paul is striving for faithfulness to the point of sacrifice. What beautiful imagery. And what a challenge that we would say, we would say, if my life is burned up and used up, if my life is poured out and forgotten, if my life is remembered, there's no, there's no building named after me. There's no markers. There's no stones. If a hundred years from now, I am but dust. But the gospel of Christ is remembered and proclaimed through those I've met. Then rejoice with me. Powerful imagery. Paul, having no idea of where his words would go 2,000 years later, sitting in a prison thinking realistically, this is it. I'm going to write a joyful letter, and I'm going to say, if I'm lost and forgotten, but the message goes on through you, rejoice with me, for it would have all been worth it. A prayer in response. Consider these words, and consider what it means to say it, to take a moment, and to have one of those, I'm making a proclamation, and I'm planting my flag in the sand, and I'm saying, Whatever happens, Lord, pray it with me. Help me do what trust in you requires. Now, we have examples. And last week, I gave you the example of Sadiq and his wife who was killed. And Sadiq went on to preach a message of forgiveness through that tragedy in his own life. This is a quote from one of my favorite theologians. And it is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Would you raise your hand if you've ever heard the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Great, okay. For those of you who have not and don't know the story maybe, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran theologian and his prominence unfortunately came into being during the Nazi regime. And so he was one of the vocal critics and when it became apparent that the Nazi regime had even infiltrated the church, he establishing a way of being faithful that emphasizes God alone as the head of the church. And in one of his famous books about discipleship and following Jesus, for all his eloquence, and translating German to English is just dry, he has these profound moments of clarity in his writing that are not so complicated. And this is one of those statements. No one should be surprised at the difficulty of faith because it's not finding your keys. And you know, we have things to help you today if you lose your keys. Apple has come out with a little tag that you can put on your keys. And if you lose your phone, you can go to findmyphone.com and, and Apple will actually, and I've done it, I've used it, I've lost my phone and I've gone on there and found the GPS and oh, it's in my house, it says it's in my house and I turn the ping on and it starts beaconing to me and I find it invariably where I did not look. Striving for organization is one thing. Striving for faithfulness is another. And nobody here should be surprised. It's hard. Because the standard is Christ. The thing that we look to and look for is not complicated. 
The revealed Christ is in your Bible. There is no mystery. Different interpretations of the same person, but it's there for all to discover. The standard of Christ as the faithful one is in your Bible. Different interpretations, but clearly laid out. That's why it's important that you read and reflect for yourself. Read Philippians chapter 1. Read Philippians chapter 2. Hear Paul's understanding of Christ is the faithful one. No matter what, find the good in all things. No matter what, being faithful as Christ who is the standard for us. That's what we should strive for. And then come up with your own proclamations that challenge your understanding each day. This is mine in response to all of this. Where the gospel of Jesus Christ is lived, and I wrote this a long time ago and put it in my prayer journal, and the second time I read it, I got nervous because I realized what I'd written. Where the gospel of Jesus Christ is lived, believers will pray for the will of God to be done through them no matter the cost. This is where it hits us. If my life is poured out like a libation, if my life is remembered no more, if all the things I've strived for and sweated for and used as a standard of success I realize are in vain, and the only thing I got right in this life, and it's all forgotten, but Christ is proclaimed as the source of salvation, then rejoice with me. If there's no marker on my headstone, if there is no awards, if my funeral is not attended, rejoice with me if I held true to one simple idea, no matter what happens. Being faithful with Christ as the standard is the measure of what we should strive for. Would you say our memory verse together with me again, and we'll close today's message. Let's read it together. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Holy Spirit, come and sink into our hearts the message that comes from the saints who have come before us. There are many who have attended San Pedro, who the next generation of saints will not know by name. Whether they have a plaque or a marker, or whether they have simply been here and faithfully served for your glory, that they were poured out like sacrificial offerings is what we rejoice over today. And that we should one day join them, whether it's today, tomorrow, or in years to come, we will say, to live is Christ, to die is gain. May we trust that the words from the Apostle Paul are relevant for us today. For however we live, that we would glorify the believers who came before us is not our aim, but to glorify you alone. So we trust that for your glory alone we exist, and we will hold faithfulness against the standard of Jesus Christ as the way of life. Be glorified by your people today who respond to your word in faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I would encourage you to take a moment and fill out your connection cards. You can find them in the pew. That helps us with attendance, but it also shows you some different places that you can get involved in the life of our congregation. If you're a member and you're here each week, just put your name on it. We don't need your address each week, your email each week, but just if something changes, let us know and we can update it in our records this week. Um, we're asking for some help, and I don't know why my slide is not up there, but um, there's going to be a reception following a memorial service next Saturday. It's a memorial service for my mom. Betty Hayes needs some help planning that service, getting things together for that service. If you would, you can fill it out um, on the connection card and then and forward that to the office. You can put it in the tray in the back, or I imagine Betty will be sitting in the narthex um, and you can talk with her there as well. Let us continue our time of worship as we give God thanks.
for the many gifts that he has given us as we respond with our prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we offer our thanks for the many gifts that you have given us, for the many ways that you have blessed us in our lives. We ask that you take these offerings and use them to build your kingdom. We ask that you take our very lives and use them to do the work of your kingdom in this world. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now let us continue in prayer as we go before God with the prayers of the people and the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. God of healing, God of wholeness, as the world is opening, people are traveling, and our faces are once again being seen from behind our mask. It would be easy to forget where we've been, what we've learned, and who we've lost. Help us, holy God, not to be so desperate to move forward that we fail to appreciate the present. A communion of friends gathering sounds of children playing together, the open road of vacation adventures. Help us, holy God, not to be so desperate to move on that we neglect to pray for those still suffering, the businesses that are forced to close, employees laid off, families grieving, loved ones lost, patients still waiting for renewed health. Help us, holy God, embrace the lessons we have learned, the grace we have received, and the hope you offer every day, but especially especially in the tough and tragic days when we lean on our faith to get us through. You're here for us, God, and we are grateful. Help us be here for each other, acting as your hands and your feet in a hurting world. Help us, O oh God, to believe in your faithfulness. Bless us, O oh God, with an encouraging heart. Help us, O oh God, to do what trust in you requires. Heavenly Father, we remember those who are ill. Bless them with healing be with those caring for them. Bless them with wisdom. We remember those who grieve this day, especially Ed and Cheryl and their family. Grant them your peace that passes all understanding. United as a family of faith, and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Finally, hear us pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you for joining us in worship. Next week, we'll continue with Philippians chapter 3. We are grateful for all of your faithfulness and generosity as well. We did collect our 50 backpacks quickly this year, but then we jumped rather abruptly to school supplies. So we're running behind. If you are able to get some school supplies, go online and you'll get the list or check at the table as you leave today. But we would uh, certainly appreciate anyone getting on the ball and getting us some school supplies so we don't have to supplement all of it out of the mission budget. You can bring them up here during the week if you need to. So thank you for your faithfulness and generosity. We're pushing the school supplies. Paul? And now, friends, may the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.